to discuss all of this and more, I'm delighted to welcome Sandrine Dixon de Cleve, the co-president of the Club of Rome, and Luisa Neubauer, a climate activist and author to the stage. Please join me. Welcome to you both. How are you both doing? Fine, thank you. There is a lot to discuss, um, but I want to start not necessarily in the present, but in a bit of the past. Mm -hmm. The war certainly caught some Western leaders by surprise, surprising as that may to believe, but the energy shock after that seems to have truly taken policymakers, especially in Europe, by surprise, which is rather extraordinary considering Europe has been reliant on Russian fossil fuels for a long time now. Sandrine, can you talk about the degree to which you've been acutely aware of this problem and maybe even raise the alarm about it? Yeah, absolutely. They should not have been surprised, and I don't think they truly were. Um, mm. I think it was denial rather than surprise. And let me just correct you on one thing. We don't have a war, we have an invasion. I think it's really important to say that. The Ukraine has been invaded. It is not actually fighting a war with Russia. It is now because it's defending itself. Okay. Now, to go back, already when we prepared the energy and climate package for the European Commission and talked and about that was already in 2010. So we're 12 years ago now. 12 years ago, we clearly suggested that we could wean ourselves off Russian gas just by implementing energy efficiency measures, and we would be 100% off Russian gas by 2030. This was even before we had Nord Stream 2. So we made it very clear, those of us that were working in the energy sector, and I was an advisor to the European Commission at that time, I was working with King Charles, at that time he was Prince Charles, um, and, and, it, and we had all of the analysis from those that were actually looking at energy efficiency, but also we were looking at supply, we knew that we needed to triple investments in renewables, but that we could do it, that actually price parity was going to come, and that we could start to truly invest and shift. The technology was there. Some of that happened, but not at the pace that was necessary. Yeah. And so just very briefly, before we turn to Louisa, why not? What prevented policymakers who had the briefs in front of them, who understood, in your estimation, the true cost of reliance on Russian fossil fuels from actually taking those necessary steps? I think there were a variety of factors. I think in Germany, and Louisa can reflect on this a bit more, there clearly was the desire to start to pull out of nuclear. There was pressure from the Green Party. There was also a desire to bring the Green Party more into the political mainstream. And that pressure made it that actually, if they were going to phase out nuclear, that they needed to start to look at other resources, and gas was an obvious one. This unholy alliance between Merkel and Russia really bothers me, and I do feel even though I very much respect Merkel in other ways, that this is an area where she truly got us into trouble. So I think part of that was that development of a very unholy alliance, and the other was that it is much more, it's easier to continue to invest in what you know than actually to truly shift and transition. Right. And that transition was not going as fast as it should. The signal should have been there. We put in place the policy, but the investment community wanted short-term profits, and gas was giving them those short-term profits, as was oil and coal. And this is the story of the last 30 years of humanity, you could argue, but yeah. we can't go there just yet. Louisa, I want to turn to your journey, but I need to ask you to respond as a German citizen to Sandrine's uh, impressions on former President Merkel. Uh, do you share her assessment that Merkel bears a fair amount of responsibility for getting us, or at least keeping us, in this mess that we're in? Well, yes, of course, and I also told this to Mrs. Merkel when meeting her um, and discussed it with her and, and, and raised the point that it is, um, it is in so many ways irresponsible how energy systems in Germany and the European continent have been designed, and not only empowering and equipping now an autocrat in Russia to, to invade the Ukraine, but also to um, create this completely um, dispensable weak spot mm -hmm. of the European democracies, mm -hmm. uh, which is our energy systems. And I think you talked about being surprised. I would actually say it has become a, um, a political tool to, to appear to be surprised by things that were all known, mm -hmm. that where we're told everywhere, that we're written down, that we're you know, warned before. 
And in order to not at any cost say that you might have made a mistake at some point, that you just didn't want to listen to everyone out there who told us about the danger of Vladimir Putin and his energy sources, you rather act surprised and pretend you didn't know anything. And maybe one of those lessons learned, and you ask, how is it that nobody acted um, accordingly, how even though all the possibilities, the, the technologies, the money was all there to, to make us free from Vladimir Putin and create a fossil-free energy system, I think there's a big lesson behind that, and that is as long as fossil fuel companies and their political supporters get to make the rules about the transition away from fossil free fuels, we won't get that transition. It's not happening. Mm -hmm. And that is something that you know comes back to us again and again and again, just in this very moment, at this COP actually. Who is making the rules here for the energy transitions? Is it, is it a lobbyist from the gas and the oil companies? Or is it the ones who have an interest in, you know, having some more you know, human life on this planet for, say, some more centuries? That is, I think, uh, that is a big question in the room. Let me add that this is not conspiracy theorizing. There was a report out today that showed more than 200 official delegates at COP27 were either representing or had significant ties to the oil and gas industry, which I believe uh, a, a, a member of a delegation just told me is more delegates than the combined delegations of the G7. Yeah, and I think they, they speak even of 600 or so oil and gas lobbyists, so that's you know, more people here than a significant amount of country delegations combined. Raise your hand if you work yeah. for the oil and gas industry. We would have some messages for you. Um, <laughs> but maybe, <laughs> maybe if I could just, just add a point about, um, uh -huh. about the energy systems, because I think there used to be this, this rumor in the room when it comes to energy that there is that you can dis that you can divide energy systems from values mm. Mm. and that you can have fossil fuels and human rights mm. and it's not working out mm. and there is no hidden corner in our energy systems there is no secret spot where you can you know discuss your energy policies and hope just no one is watching people are watching and more than that, people are being violated by those fossil fuels and the autocrats behind it. And maybe that is the big lesson and the big message from the invasion and from the energy crisis we're in. Yeah. I, I also think it's really important not to just demonize the people within the energy sector, because there are many people who want to see change. But you began we, your career in the energy well, sector. Well, I started, yeah, oh. I started my career in, in oil and gas and predominantly advising for cleaner fuels. I wrote the legislation. In fact, I'm very proud because we did get sulfur down by a thousand parts per million, which is huge in Europe and across the globe because of the legislation that the European Union put in in the 90s and also our emissions requirements. But I think what's very important, and exactly to Louisa's point, is that the extractive sectors make huge profits off extraction. They always have. In fact, downstream oil and gas is very different, downstream oil in particular, from upstream. Upstream is where the money is. And those extractive sectors and those investments are big profits. We see it now in terms of the windfall profits that we have in Europe. They have had the best quarter, perhaps the best year in history at a moment that the globe is experiencing energy poverty. Let's Ab sit with that. Absolutely. And so we have to say, and how do you then bring that morality back in? I mean, the Club of Rome for the last 50 years has been talking about the limits to growth. We talked about an extractive economy that was actually going to really put us against the planetary boundaries. And that's where we are now. We, for many, many years, have talked about how that extraction is going to create the tipping points, both social and environmental. And so maybe just to complete, what I find incredibly important for us to understand, if we're going to fight the extractive economy, and in particular the oil and gas sector, is we have to be much more strategic. We need to absolutely have the policy signals, but we need to also have both top-down, bottom-up, at the same time to do a double squeeze, because otherwise we are not going to be able to stop their power, which dictates that short-term profit motive that most of the financial community is continuing to foster. One last thought, we are still importing gas from Russia through China. Belgium, the economy where I am right now, is 86% of its trade is still going actually 
part of it to Russia. So the fact is, this de these unholy dependencies exist, and we need to put a stop to it and fully shift the way in which we address our economic dependencies on fossil energy, but also on materials, which is incredibly important. So let's talk about some of the ways that, and it's going to take a lot of ways, coming at this from many angles, that we actually start to make those changes. Louisa, I want to just very briefly tell us a bit about your journey to being on this stage here today. In 2018, you met a very influential figure that I venture to guess changed the course of your life. Who was that, and what movement did you bring to Germany? Well, um, um, yeah, um, of course. Um, so, well, I grew up, you know, I grew up in one of the most privileged parts of the world, and, you know, as a white, educated girl, um, I grew up in a world that told me that things would just work out and that our government would take care of things. And if there were an environmental problem, it was always just a problem. It was never a crisis or a catastrophe. And everything around me would tell me, work hard, um, you know, work hard, work hard, work hard. And then, you know, eventually you can be at, at some point where you, we adjust some of the little problems we have. It was never about a systems failure. It was never about governmental governments almost boycotting climate targets. So um, when I started my activism, it was something that I would call handshake activism, looking back. It was about benefiting you know, the system, about doing as everyone else would be doing to eventually shake the hand of a minister and take a photo. And there was something that was obviously liked and that was wanted and they called it youth participation, but eventually it was really just handshaking. And it is, looking back, it makes sense because that was a world that was shown to me and that was what everyone around me would imply to me. Um, so it took me really, um, it took me a long time and I'm glad that people now, you know, are much quicker in that. Um, it took me years to figure out that something is inherently wrong with the way we go around and that it needs much more than problem solving. Um, so I met Greta at the climate conference four years ago in Katowice and I originally went there to find out what the place looks like where they solve the climate crisis, you know? Yeah. And I, I found a place where they were doing lots of things, but surely not solving the climate crisis. But I found this one girl who was speaking the truth. And mm. even though I wasn't going to school anymore, and I wasn't a school child or so, I thought, okay, you know, we need to do something here, and we need to do it in a very different way than we used to do it. And I went back to Germany, and with many others, we started the Fighters for Future movement there. And we grew and grew and grew and we protested with millions and um, we, um, after a year or so, decided that we need to go a step further because after one and a half million people on the streets were there and we had the majorities everywhere, we had the unions behind us and the farmers and the workers and the hospitals and the nurses and every generation had a majority of people who wanted radical climate action. We had all that done, but our government was still not acting and we were like, fine, we see us at court. And so we went to court, to the Constitutional Court, and we sued a government, and we won. Um, Just let that sit again. <laughs> well, but to be fair, you know, this is a win for us, but it's a loss for a generation. No, 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 no young women in a democracy should have to sue her own democratic government over climate mm -hmm. inaction. Mm -hmm. this, is so de this is so saddening, and this is so wrong in every single way. It is our constitutional court declaring that the inaction of our government, and not just the German government, but of governments worldwide, is threatening our freedoms, our rights, our perspectives. What, what kind of ruling is that? What does it say about the state of democracies in the world? You know, that is worrying, and I think you know, there is a very, very dark side to this, to this kind of you know, very unique win at the constitutional court. Well, and let me ask, you went from handshake activism to litigation activism, yes. if you will. Sure. You won in 2021. You're yeah. more than a year after that victory now. Yeah. What has changed? Well, we then had an election, and um, as we did, we organized a majority in every single, like voters of every single democratic parties in a majority said they want radical climate action. We provided 30,000 scientists to provide plans to, the, to all the parties to say, this is what you can do. We made climate change the dominating topic of the, of the election, even though we had corona to that point, we had other issues. Um, and we got um, the, the white, e most ecological government in the history of Germany. We put everything in place. But what we find now is electing the right people to the right decision is a tiny fraction of what needs to be done. And what comes after is what we find 
is even harder than the work before, because it means we need to acknowledge it is still up to us. Even the greenest governments of all, they won't you know, take that burden that we have to do. We still have to organize, we still have to build pressure, we need to be smarter and quicker and more strategic yeah. and more radical and provide the solutions, but also make the solutions that we have powerful and famous um, and, and create this lobby behind that, that can actually beat the fossil fuel status quo. Mm -hmm. And that is really hard work. Mm -hmm. And I, it was, I think, tough for many people in the German and European societies to acknowledge that, that it's not just about getting that one green government that will do the job for us, but it's, yeah, it's up to us. Mm -hmm. Those are the limitations of democracy as well. Sandrine, when, when you think about this moment we're in, I'm almost hesitant to ask this question because I, I don't know that there's a decisive answer, but do you believe the war is accelerating or delaying the energy transition in Europe in particular? I know that's a hard one to answer, but let me specify by saying, if it can accelerate the transition, what are the tactical things that need to happen right now, or maybe that are already happening, to enable that to occur, whether that's repower EU or whatever it might be? Yeah. So the jury is out. Yeah. It really is. I know. And it could go either I know. way. Yeah. Um, so let's, let's take the worst example. The worst example is for the moment we are going back to stranded assets. We are using gas as a buffer. We're setting up further unholy alliances, some with the Middle East. We're going into Africa. We're pushing certain of our colonial neighbors because that's really what it is. It's post-colonialism at its worst going back to extraction, supporting them actually to go towards coal. We're having discussions, Germany in particular, with South Africa. That is the part that if it continues, and there's a lot of protest and a lot of pushback, will really bring us backwards, yeah. not build forwards. So let's hope that we don't go in that direction. We're currently at a tipping point, and I'm hopeful that people will see the light, in particular in the member states and also at the European Commission level. However, where are some of the levers? And there are possible levers. One possible lever is sustainable finance. Now, they blew it on that point as well. I'm sitting on the sustainable finance platform and the taxonomy, which was supposed to actually evaluate what is green and what is brown. And we very clearly indicated from an environmental and a greenhouse gas emission perspective, we could not allow for gas to be included. And from an environmental perspective, we could not allow for nuclear. For political reasons, Germany and France pushed both into the scheme, and the taxonomy has now gone ahead with both. That is now, actually several countries are suing, as well as NGOs, the European Commission, and several countries. Let's hope that they see the light on that as well, because sustainable finance is fundamental. It triggers environmental shifts within the investment community, we can hope. And just to be clear, th those taxonomies uh, determine which fuels and investments are subsidized. Uh, absolutely. And well, not subsidized. No, they determine where investment capital, private investment capital will go. Subsidies is, a, is the other aspect. We need to get rid of the perverse subsidies. We have far too many that are supporting fossil energy. And we need to shift some of that money into transition funds to enable us to move towards renewables. So that is the other potential lever that we have. However, here is a blind spot that we need to be very careful about, and this is my greatest worry. We are entering into the winter months. We actually know now that we've been able to cut down from 40% dependency down to about 5% now in the last three months, which is phenomenal in terms of Russia. Now we are compensating by bringing in other sources. From other we've, dictators. From other dictators. We have storage. So we stored enough to get us through the winter. Next winter is going to be the hard one. This one's OK, and if we have a really hot summer, that's going to be tough as well. What do we do in between time? We must support European citizens that are getting hit by inflation, energy poverty, and energy poverty also turns into transport poverty. That is my greatest worry. So at this time, we need to make sure that member states are supporting those citizens why? One, because we want to ensure that people do not go hungry. Post-COVID, this is already a very stressful situation across Europe. But number two, the potential democratic backlash, the potential growth of populism, the potential growth, actually, of the instability across the European Union because people are frustrated, pissed off, and therefore populistic governments come in and fuel that in order to get elected into government 
is a real risk. We don't know anything about that in the United States. Right. No, no, no. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so lucky and over there, it could there, happen huh? again. Yeah. It could happen again. Be careful what you wish for. Against, against that very real warning, and I, I think it's absolutely a risk. It's, it's one of these ripple effects that you can't predict mm -hmm. when an event like this begins to unfold. How do you make the case to European citizens, especially those that might be having a hard time paying their energy bills as it gets cold, that they still need to be concerned about climate change, that they should care where the source of their fuel comes from? So I've got two answers to that. One, one is that the cheapest fuel ever is energy efficiency. It's the fuel you don't use. And that we have not, I mean, this is unsexy, right? You can't cut a big ribbon in front of a big power plant. It's what I call the anti-testosterone effect. That's why most men don't want to do it. Instead, I mean, energy efficiency, it just hasn't, doesn't have that sexiness factor. And yet, it is unbelievably effective. The amount of energy that we can cut and actually enable citizens to be smart in the way in which they use energy is fundamental. We need to roll out huge programs in terms of insulation, in terms of heat pumps, in terms of also reducing temperatures by 1%. The incredible BCM increase, the amount of increase in terms of energy this is, that, this is an acronym free zone. You have to explain what BCM is. Well, it's barrels. It's, uh, you know, it is the, the value. I'm not going to get too much into the technical, but it is the value of the volumes actually of saved energy that we could actually use. And Great. I think that that is incredibly important. Yeah. And that needs to be introduced into the system. Louisa, you, you, please. Yeah. So I think there is, you know, there's so many fairy tales around the climate that I think, you know, one of those fairy tales is when the climate, when the crisis hits, we will act. And, you know, the, the war in Russia, the, the, the war that Russia started the invasion, you know, was, I would say, if people really don't care about the climate somehow, um, they might, you know, they do technically tend to care about not being shot by uh, Russian troops, you know? It's a, if, if you really decide, I'm not on the ecological side, okay, fair enough, but we found out in the last months, most people do kind of care about peace because it's a, mm. it's a wonderful alternative to war, right? So, um, even if you hated the environment and you had like this, this happiness around destructing the climate fair enough, you had every single reason to get away from fossil fuels in this year mm -hmm. across the continent. So it is, but you know, we had all the, all the studies were there and the money was there and the Putin was there and it was all there. Yet governments in, in the vast majorities went again for more fossil fuels in other countries, you told mm -hmm. it, African continent and so on, increased, um, rather increase the imports from other autocrats than going for energy efficiency. Because when a crisis sits, we're not suddenly going to do something we've never done before, but we're going to do the thing that we are best at. And fossil fuel governments will do more fossil fuels. And fossil fuel lobbyists will lobby the hell out of everyone here. Mm -hmm. So a crisis in that sense, and that is what this in the energy crisis has shown, is not about you know throwing a coin, is it going to be good or bad for the climate, but it's about understanding that as long as we don't intervene with everything that we have, they will go down that fossil fuel pathway. They're just going to give it new names and new numbers and calculate the CO2 away from that. But it's still going to be fossil fuels. And new, nowadays, it's a bridge technology. And with the European taxonomy, it's also green to have more natural gas and so on. Yeah. That is a fairy tale. When the crisis comes, they will do as they did before, but much worse, much quicker, unless we, um, unless, unless we intervene. And there's another, there's another fairy tale. And that's about people not caring for the climate. Everyone on this planet needs to breathe. Everyone needs to drink water. Everyone needs to eat. Mm. If we can give it other names, but everyone inherently, as a human being on this planet, cares about what we depend on. Some might call it the climate and some might not, but technically there's no person who doesn't care for the climate. This is what we need to exist. Mm. What we have, though, is 30, 40, 50 years of fossil fuel lobbying and marketing and propaganda that tells people that the climate is something that doesn't concern us, that some eco-lobbyists want to do, and that means taking away from everyone else. But that is, and that's why I think when we approach people and you know, ask them, please take care of the climate, this is also about deconstructing all these fairy tales, this fossil fuel lobbying, the propaganda. It's about unlearning what people think the climate is and what it isn't. 
And so when people go out now and they care for their lives, they care for their jobs, they care for paying the rent and all those things, it shouldn't be played out against the climate, but we should be able to acknowledge and our politicians should be able to acknowledge that people can have more than one worry at a time. Mm. And they are all worrying, we are all worrying to pay the, the rent at the end of the month, but we are all worrying about the end of the decade as well. Yeah, and that is, both, mm. that is both there and that is both legitimate and that is both something that governments should take care of, instead of playing it out against each other pretending we have to decide between the end of the month and the end of the decade yeah well can said. i build on that please Sandra. because i think louise is absolutely right and i i also think that there's a real missing link here and this is where there's not enough policy bravery and political bravery and that is that we've just come out of the greatest crisis we've ever seen the largest transformational change across humanity and society in order to deal with a pandemic, okay? That transformational shift, that going back to what is essential, exactly to Louisa's point, what do people think is essential to their lives? Their lives for staying alive? Secondly, ensuring that they actually have access to healthcare, ensuring that they stay safe and that their friends and family stay safe. Politicians are not tapping into that. They're going back to business as usual, as if COVID never happened. They're going back to the usual neoliberal patterns of extractive economies, where it's all power-based. It's what I call the three Ps, power, profit, and patriarchy. I have a much more diminishing word, which we could use. Patriarchy. Link, you can link use to, it. Link to testosterone, which you could just mm -hmm. imagine. Um, but the fact of the matter is you can shift from that to people, planet, and prosperity and peace pretty easily if you construct it for people. And here's how you do that, by demonstrating to them exactly what Louisa says, which is this is a vision of hope. Mm. This is actually ensuring that we build resilience through our economies. This is stepping away from the over-financialization of our current economy, which no longer actually functions according to what people's needs are. You cannot tell me that the majority of people across the globe, even in the West, right now, are actually doing well, or what they thought was going to be well in terms of the economy. We have also the highest amount of mental illness we've ever had. We have the first generation of young people who will be making less than their parents, many of them who are moving back home, students that actually can't afford to live in accommodation. And we also have the highest rate of suicide. Not only is our planet sick, our civilization is sick. And yet we're allowing politicians to continue to push for an extractive economy, in particular to get quick profit so that the financial market functions that way, rather than coming back to looking at what is the real economy. Last point, Europe's economy is made up of how much SMEs? Does anyone know? Small and medium-sized enterprises make up how much of the European economy? Anybody know out there? Give me a number. 93. 98%. 98% of our friggin' economy is based on SMEs across Europe, and here we are catering to oil and gas multinationals. The people are the SMEs. Those are the ones that we need to foster, many of whom are going out of business because we don't seem to care about their economic needs. That's how you start to transform an economy. But you need to storytell, you need to build the narrative, you need to make it important for them and their lives. Is that aligned? Thank you. Is that narrative? one that really questions some of the fundamental assumptions of our economy, one that is aligned with the climate justice movement that you are so uh, intimately enmeshed with at this moment, are these same goals of really thinking about recalibrating who benefits, who profits, whether people should profit to this extent, a part of the climate work at this point? Well, I mean, why are we in the climate crisis? I mean, there's this fossil fuel economies um, and the burning of coal, then oil, now gas, and at some point they will tell us that burning forests is no, the new sustainable. Um, you know, this is, this is a, a fossil fuel driven economy behind it that is not only destructing 
people's mental livelihood, but it's also destructing health and, and you know, our cities and our, our nature and everything that we, that we hold dear to us. And, um, you know, one question at this point might be, why is it that the fossil fuel industries and the fossil fuel companies across the European continent and beyond are making such incredible profits this year? Like, who has, like whose money is that? And that's the people's money, because they can't pay their bills anymore. Their, their bills are skyrocketing. And that is the, that is the historic um, sums that these fossil fuel companies are making. So how is it that we pretend that now we have a new problem, which is high energy bills for the people, and then you know, we acknowledge that as a problem, but look away when we look at where is the money gone? Like, what, what kind of understanding is it? Who are we doing this for? Like, what is, what is the role of democracies? What is the role of our governments? Isn't that about making sure that people are protected from that kind of systems that are, dis that are taking without, um, without any kind of accountability? So, of course, we, are, we, we need to radically think about who are we doing all this for and who is eventually profiting for this. And I think this goes much further than CO2 or emissions. Just imagine what it would be like if, if you know, if children had the same rights in, in inner cities than SUVs did. I mean, crazy, you yeah. know? Mm. If, if they could feel as safe as, as the metal of a car um, parking there 23 hours a day, imagine what it would be like if parents knew that for, by, by working and by trying to, you know, pay up the bills for the children, they would not be working against their own children's future. That has something to do with respect and dignity. That's not something, you know, where you need to love the glacier in Greenland or, or anything. I think that is something that has to do with what, you know, the, the very human side of this, of what, what, who are we in this world? And, um, you know, what are we, in what kind of world do we want to live in? And I mean, we are on the African continent. Imagine we could sit next to our African friends here and look them in the eye and know that we are not taking with our economies their lives and their perspectives. Yeah. Yeah. Imagine that human moment when we could look each other into the eye and know we are in full solidarity with each other, whatever it takes. Mm -hmm. Because this is not something that has to do with charity, but with dignity and with, with what connects us as humans. And that is eventually a very a, a question um, that is so neatly tied to this COP. Is it now that the energy method we just discussed in, in Europe, will that be, will that struggles and the mess that our governments created and the industries behind it, will we make the African communities, the people in sub saharan the, the most affected people, will we make them pay the price? Yeah. By, by pushing for more gas, come there just to provide Well, we're our transitioning, quo. by the way. We're pushing them into more stranded assets. Yeah. Of course. And the perversity there yes. is ridiculous. And will we, will we push for new dependencies? Will we, will we push for more fossil fuels, more destructions, just to pretend that there wasn't a huge mistake made on the European continent and many other countries now that we will have to get away from, meaning away from all fossil fuels? Yeah. Let's talk brass tacks. As we know from COPs, this inspiration and this passion is essential mm. to sort of putting wind in the sails, but it takes policy, yeah. it takes regulations to get anything done in this world. So first to you, Sandrine, and I want to come back to you on some of these social issues. Sandrine, when you think about the energy roadmap for Europe in the next 18 to 24 months, what does it look like that accomplishes all these competing aims simultaneously to the best that you can imagine? Lowering prices, making the transition. So, so I also am ambassador for the Energy Transition Commission, and actually the Energy Transition Commission brings together commissioners from all over the world, really thinking through some of these dilemmas. And it's interesting. Um, we had meetings with uh, several members of the cabinets across the European Commission, and we went in with a 24-month plan, and they said, can you give us your answer in six months? Just to show you how gravely we think the next six months are. Coming back to your yeah. point around are we actually going to do the right thing or the wrong thing? So what's necessary to do the right thing? As I said, the social element is fundamental. We need to get it right in terms of first, the perception at the pump and the perception in terms of the electrons. So the price for citizens absolutely needs to be capped. And we also need to think about either giving energy checks or some kind of solidarity check to enable people actually to be able to survive over the next six months. That, for me, is fundamental. Okay, those are okay? two specific policy proposals. Very specific. 
Problem is, at the European level, you can't necessarily do that. It's the member states that have to do that. So we need to figure out, working with the EIB, the European Investment Bank, and the ECB, the central bank, whether we can create a package. And that's what I'm trying to do, actually, is to work with them and also private investors to create a fund that would enable them to do that. Now, on the other side, we absolutely have to decouple the gas price from the renewables price. What's happening right now is those windfall profits, and I'm actually on the board of an amazing Portuguese electricity company that has said we will be 100% out of fossil energy by 2030. Crunch, this has just hit now. They were in the process of going fully renewables, have pulled out of most of their coal sites, have put in place just transition plans, have worked with people on the ground to make this a reality, all the right things. And now all of a sudden we see that the investment community is going gung-ho once back again for stranded assets. So we need to make sure that we help those companies that actually are in the midst of the transition and that said this is what we want to do and work with the European policymakers in order to make that happen. We need to decrease permitting times in terms of infrastructure. We need to address transmission and distribution, which is actually fundamental and one of the main problems. You know, we've been talking about transmission between Portugal, Spain, and France forever. The line is blocked because of competition between the electricity providers on the French side in particular and also on the Spanish side. So we have to ensure that we unblock that. But I think what's really important now is that the backlash that's happening on the energy prices could also hit the renewable providers, even though we all know that actually renewables are cheaper than gas right now. And they're very worried about that because that means that actually the consumer doesn't see the difference between renewables and gas. They just see that the energy price has gone up. We should be like we did with the fuel quality directive we brought in cleaner fuels, we made the cleaner fuels the price of what the dirty fuels were before, and we increased the dirty fuel right. price. No brainer. What did the customer do? They came to the pump, they saw the cleaner fuel was the, the good price, they pumped up with the cleaner fuel, the, the dirty fuel slowly goes out, that differential is put into a just transition fund. That's what we need to do right now in terms of the electricity market. Don't let anyone say they don't know how to do it. There's your laundry list of proposals. Louisa, when you think about some of these, and I know this is a challenge, but more abstract issues around who benefits, what's just, when you think about having already sued your own government and won, when you think about the degrees to which the climate considerations they are now expected to think about at every critical juncture are actually going to be implemented, what are the concrete ways that you see that will give you faith in as much as you can have it that your government, for one, and other governments are actually starting to take these considerations into account when making decisions about your future? Well, um, you know, a city as a Christian, but I think faith is really irrelevant here in this. What we need is, is the knowledge that the change is possible. We have that knowledge, we have the plans, and we need the courage to stand up for them. That has nothing to do with hope or with optimism or whatever. Uh, what we need is to understand that if we don't step up for all the good solutions that we have, they won't put, put into place, no matter how good they are. Mm. That is also another big lesson from the last 30 years of a lot of failed attempts to get a green economy running, to transition away from fossil fuels. It's, it's not about being right or morally right in the climate crisis. It's not about having the good plans or the experts or the science behind us or the Paris Agreement. It's not about that. It's not about having the solution, but building power behind the solution. Um, because otherwise, we're up against these powerful fossil fuel interests. And, you know, this is a power play. And it has, you know, it, it become from a standpoint of morale. But if there's one thing I think that in the climate movement we lacked for a long time is understanding that being morally right mm. does nothing <laughs> in, in the climate crisis, it's about fighting for that, um, mm. to, 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 to reach the point and the people, to channel that energy mm. towards the hard decisions that have to be made. And so um, what we're seeing, and I think that is a really, um, really important aspect for a long time, climate and social rights were played out against each other. Again, another fairy tale, you can have social justice or climate justice, but please people make a decision there and we'll let you decide that and we step back and do nothing to change it. That's the past 20 years. So now what we're seeing is that these, th these things are interconnected. If people want to be free and um, have 
you know, affordable energy sources at hand, they need to be fossil free. That's, that's it's so simple to understand and you know, to, don't need to be a climate nerd to get into that. So what we're doing in, in countries like Germany, but across the continent really is we're uniting social movements and climate movements to take away that nitty gritty idea from governments that they, you know, that they will have a, a right wing backlash um, or some more populism coming from that, from that side who so want to go back to fossil fuels from Russia for some reason or so on. But we're taking that and, and um, putting that as some of the part, like integrating that as a DNA of what we are fighting for. And that's, I think, something really beautiful. But nonetheless, I think there's a big danger in, in, in the decisions that are made these days, just because the transition is, is happening and the end of the fossil fuel era across the continent, it's an eyesight. And that does something to, to the companies that, you know, are very much not okay with that. Yeah. And they're getting back. And this fossil fuel backlash, we are seeing it. It's happening here at the COP. It's happening in Europe. It's happening across the globe. They're fighting, they're fighting very, very hard to get back into the names. They give them new names. They build new companies. They create new slogans. And they really want to be there. So in order for those fossil fuel companies not to again dictate the rules of our transition away from those very companies and their powers, we need to be there to, to, to stop that mm -hmm. from happening just once more. We, we ha don't have the time anymore. We have no single day to waste for more fossil fuels, fairy tales, and more blah, blah, blah. So that is, I think, the moment where, you know, I'm asked so much about faith and about if I hope that's going to be better and if I believe we will have a green future. We can have all of that, but we will need to fight for this, even though it's hard. And it's hard these days mm -hmm. to fight for good solutions because the crisis is accumulating and it's hard on people's shoulders. And the children out there, the young people, they're in despair. They're really, really scared of what's going on. It's getting harder and harder every single day to step up, to organize, to show the courage. But we still have to do it. And then we see that everything is technically possible. And we are in the position where we can unite these very, very powerful solutions that we have with the power from the people mm. to push for that, but it won't be there no matter what. It will be there if we if we go for it, if we fight for it, in the institutions and and on the streets. Terrific. Let's go to questions from the audience. Raise your hand, please. If we've got questions, there the lights are on. We may even have microphones. Yeah. There we go. Thank you. Please, we'll take two at a time. Yes. It's coming up. And, and also the same thing. What do you tell to people that are, are around the globe? And how can they also engage uh, globally in the, the daily life? Mm. Thank you. Great. How can we engage globally? And there is one more question in the row just in front. We'll just take two at a time. Thanks. Hi. Thank you. Um, my question is about what you said about making the dirty energy more expensive. Sorry. The yep. Making the clean yep. energy the price, and then yep. that just seems like the most incredible solution. Like, what is holding us back from that just happening? Yeah. yeah. Good question. <laughs> Other than, I guess, lobbying just, it. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Why don't we start with the the second and end yeah. with the first? Yeah. So I know it's a no-brainer, right? Um, again, I and think. Isn't that what happened to the German? like green energy transition in yes. the 20 years ago. Isn't yeah. that what we implemented? That's what it's actually been implemented. It's yeah. been implemented, but the problem is that it's, the, it's that decoupling of the gas price actually from renewables. So it's very different when we're talking about fuels at the pump, because there actually we could make electrical vehicles cheaper and, and actually fueling up through electricity cheaper than actually going to pump up. Now, the only problem there, and this is why I'm actually not a... 100% proponent of electrification and going, moving immediately to electric cars. And this is, we haven't actually talked about this, and I apologize for taking a little bit of a round trip because I think it's really important. That systemic, that lack of systemic thinking, that we are now thinking that we're going to replace one diesel engine with an electric vehicle is totally wrong. We need to totally shift our mobility system so that we optimize it to get people from A to B, and we reduce our emissions. Yeah. And I really have a problem when everyone goes electrical vehicles, electrical vehicles. One, because they're much more expensive, and again, those that are going to suffer the most are the ones that need it most. So it will be the gilets jaunes in the streets because they won't be able to get it. So 
One of the ways in which we need to be very clear is we need to offer mobility, full stop. We need to make it cheap and easy for people to get from A to B, whatever that might be. It might be a bicycle, it might be a bus, and if it needs to be a car, then it can be a car. But I think we need to optimize our mobility systems and make it as inexpensive as possible. And actually, the solutions are much cheaper that way than immediately just investing in electrical vehicles. Now, it gets more complicated on the electricity side, at least from a European perspective, because as I said, the market is tied to the gas. It's the highest price on the market that dictates what the electron, so that energy source, is going to be sold at. And that is the biggest problem that we have. So we're not distinguishing the difference. So we need to decouple the gas price from the renewables price, make renewables the cheaper price, which it is, and the gas price higher, and you will start to see the transition, in particular for manufacturing sites, which, by the way, for the moment, are suffering the most yeah. and are really having a hard time. What can people do? I really think it's important to try to shift our lives so that we can actually make a difference, but I also think it is so important to have a voice. People think, okay, I'll stop eating meat, or I will take public transport, or I'll ride a bike, and all of that is important, or I'll use less materials, buy less clothes, etc. But it is so important to use your voice. What Louisa and the other activists have done has been phenomenal, and I commend you. I really do, and I want to clap you, actually, for everything that you and Greta and my dear friends in Belgium, Adelaide and Anuna, who were the first four in Europe who really start to fight for this, but also all the women, young women across the globe that have taken this up. And I really believe that we have to remember that we are citizens of democracies and we have to use our voice. Right now, I'm very worried about the midterm elections in the United States. It seems to be going kind of okay, but let's see. But I think it's really going to be a problem as we start to have these pressure points. When it gets tough, people go into fear, they go into denial, and they hunker down rather than opening up their hearts and their souls and their visions and think we can do this together. We have to do this together. We have no other choice. So Luisa, final thought on what people can do well, to actually make an impact globally. So in the climate crisis, there isn't a neutral spot, right? There isn't the sideline, where you feel like, oh, well, I, you know, I'll just watch and then I see what I do. When you right now feel like you're not engaging or you're not, you know, part of anything, you are doing something. You are allowing the fossil fuel status quo to continue as it is. You're normalizing an action, I'm sorry to say. Mm -hmm. That is the reality of the climate crisis and that is reality, especially in a very privileged room like this one. Everyone is making a difference. The question is, are you part of the solution or are you part of the problem? So it's less, in my opinion, about deciding to step up, but it's about deciding to change a side. Because mm. what we're seeing right now is how everyone out there is normalizing all the injustices to going on unless they decide to step up and speak up and do something. Yeah. And then there's, like, everything is open and everything is possible. And if you wonder what you can do, find that one person in your environment that, that does something and ask them. They will know something. Because there, and that's beautiful. There's not this one thing, the three-point steps that everyone can do. And that's good because we all are unique and we all have something different to offer. Easiest things are, of course, come to our protests, speak up on the Internet, inform your friends and so on, change your daily lives if you can. But more than that, find out what you can individually offer. Join a movement and give what you have to that. And that is something that, um, you know, is, is, is more needed th than ever before. We are at a moment where, where all those doors to all sides are open and can go either way, but it is not yet decided, and the ones who are making the decisions are also in this, in this very room here. It is about to ask to, to be part of that decision. And then I think there are people who say, what can I do? What kind of difference can I make? And tomorrow it's Friday, and then we're all going to go into a weekend. We have that weekend because people fought for it. We have 40-hour work weeks because people fought for it. Our entire daily lives is, is surrounded by things and by systems and by structures that people once fought for, people before us, and they did it also for us. Mm. And eventually, we cannot acknowledge all of that and enjoy all these privileges that we now have 
and then still tell this fairy tale to us that we cannot make a difference. Everything in our daily lives tells us a completely different story. So don't buy into that, but come and join us at the, yeah. at the other side, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> Time's up. I will not even attempt to have the last <laughs> word after those two extraordinary <laughs> messages. Thank you both. We will see you all back here at 4 p.m. Thank you again to our panel. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you.